The PAL world update is a much bigger deal than you might realize. From the new base pieces to condensation tweaks, the devs have added things to the game that not only improve the obvious quality of life issues we've had, but have opened up gameplay loops and possibilities that players might not have picked up on yet. First, the condensation changes. Once upon a time, if you had a 4-star pal and tossed it into the blender to make another pal more powerful, you only got credit for one pal. Now, that pal counts as itself, along with however many pals you've fed it up until that point. So if you're like me and you've maxed out an Anubis and you find that you want a different one with better perks, you only need to find that new bestie and then throw your old one into the blender to instantly bring your new one up to 4 stars. However, the biggest part of this change is the efficient use of PAL storage space. If you're deep into breeding like I am, you know that PAL storage gets very tight when you're breeding for your perfect PAL. This is an even bigger deal if you're following a chain of PAL breeding in order to move passives from other PALs onto your end goal PAL. Once you find your storage nearing capacity, you can simply choose a few of the clone rejects and feed them the blended remains of their failed siblings. Then, once you successfully make your perfect new pal, you can feed those stronger rejects into the new pal to get the benefit of condensing all of the pals you've blended before and saving a ton of pal storage space. While absolutely horrific if you think about it too much, it's a phenomenal change to help make PAL storage more efficient when diving into breeding. Next is the ore mining site. Now at first, this just feels like a quality of life change, since the sheer amount of ore you need for every metal item in the game and the ammunition you need to make is astronomical. Well, yeah, oh, and uh, the repairing, I forgot about repairing. And yes, you can use money hacks to buy ammo in some cases. I personally like to avoid tactics like that when I can. However, in the name of efficient breeding, I do buy a lot of milk and eggs. Anyway, what you might not have realized is that now you're not trapped on the one hill with both coal and ore to make your mining site. Instead, you can choose any of the areas that are strictly coal, suffer, or none of those places and build your main base wherever you want on the map and still have access to all of the ore that you need. Maybe you have a team of miners that you can deploy at your spare base to farm sulfur or quartz as you need it, so you can build here here, here, or here, and still have a huge surplus of coal and sulfur to make all of the refined ingots and gunpowder we'll need for every future update. We'll probably start to see more varied base builds which are usually inspiring, but more importantly, we'll be able to make more efficient use of the limited space we have in the base boundaries, which will make many more base designs possible, outside of the one that everyone uses. I, I think what I meant to say there was the location. I think I was talking about the space. Think about the space. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though. With the implementation of the mining station and how the raid bosses seem to be summoned now, mining teams, where you build your party to efficiently mine sulfur, coal, and quartz, might go extinct. Let me explain. In the patch notes, Surfent Terra will reduce the weight of ore while you're writing it, and while writing Astagon, the amount of ore that drops from nodes you break are increased. Now, those are great changes to make spot farming easier, but thanks to how the raid boss is summoned, it's going to be a waste of time. To summon the raid boss, you need to build a summoning altar on your base, one of the three that you have available. But when you summon the thing, the resulting battle will destroy your entire base, or at the very least, huge ginormous chunks of it. So what players will do now is create two static bases, one for mining, one for farming. Or if their design skills are impeccable, they'll have one main base for everything and two spare bases. One of those bases are going to be dedicated to summoning now. Plopping it down in an open space where the battle can happen and nothing that you built will get destroyed. And when you're not using it, you can plop the base down at any of your favorite sulfur or quartz nodes to farm up thousands of ore while you're doing other things to wind up with a surplus of ore as you farm more slabs to farm the raid boss. 
This method of mining other sources of ore is highly efficient, and now that it's necessary to keep a spare base for summoning anyway, players will just use that spare base for mining for spot mining also. This will result in making mining teams a meta that will exist just for players who want to build a party for mining just to say that they built one. All of that to say, creating a need or a usefulness for pals that aren't good for bases or combat is what the devs are attempting to do. Unfortunately, this one is a miss. And since they're introducing around 30 new pals and variations of pals like the Fire Chillet, this problem is only going to increase. Maybe they can find a way to create a base that exists in the world solely for summoning the raid boss that blocks other base functions. For now, it works, and many pals will just gather dust in your pal box or live their happy lives in their natural environment. But back to the patch notes. The next big change is of course the ability to stop pals from performing certain tasks to make your base even more efficient. Now while this is an amazing change, its implementation and design are what's most important here. Look at this post from two months ago. Beginning Mechanic 707 posted this picture, and just at a glance we can see that it's very similar to the system we have in place now. The only conclusion I want you to see here is the clearly player-driven game design that Pocket Pair is taking with Pal World. It's not outside the realm of possibility to think that they saw this post and actually started working on it when they saw it. What it looks like to me is that they're simply listening to the needs of the players and adding things to the game that help players play the game the way they want to play it. And there's no better example of this than the ability glasses and the new IV fruits that drop from the raid boss. These items were implemented for players like myself who absolutely love min-maxing their characters. The ability glasses were originally a mod that allowed players to see the hidden stats of pals that dictated their maximum potential in health, attack, and defense. It would have been enough that the devs implemented the glasses to allow players to do this without mods, but they went a step further and gave players a fruit to increase the IVs of any given stat by 10. This means that not only do you not have to find or breed a perfect 100 pal, but you can get one that's good enough and feed it fruit to make it better, just like my wife did. My point here is that the devs actively changed the game to accommodate for the emerging playstyles and make those playstyles easier to take part in without the need for mods. In line with their player-focused design, they've also introduced the Mercy Ring and the passive pal skill Mercy Hit. The Mercy Ring is a fantastic addition to the game to help players avoid accidentally killing a pal they actually wanted to capture, as well as bringing it down to the lowest possible HP to maximize the capture success rate. The pal passive Mercy Hit is a great idea, but unfortunately it's essentially another dead stat on its own. Generally, Combat Pals will be bred to have the ideal combat passive skills, and Mercy Hit, since it provides no other combat benefit other than not killing Pal, it's just going to be a liability. However, it might be a better idea for the Mercy Hit passive to have an additional attack bonus to help make the Pals utilizing the perk more effective in a team that wants to capture Pals. The attack bonus won't matter too much since they can't reduce the HP of a pal to zero, but it will still be a helpful part of the team instead of a trash passive that gets thrown into the blender. I mean, look at look at this. I, I got this. An absolutely lovely pal, ruined by a bad passive. Some of the smaller changes were for farming. Kelp C drops pal fluid, and Demud drops high quality pal oil, removing the monotonous manual farming method we used to use to farm those materials. With those in mind, I wonder how they're going to solve the meat problem for food. Farming that, farming meat for food, is equally monotonous, but it's even more necessary now that we have tiered raid bosses that are essentially DPS checks thanks to the time limit. The rest of the changes are much less important, so I won't worry about going over them at all. But these major changes, more than anything, prove the direction that Pocket Pair wants to take Pal World when it comes to the player's gaming experience. They want it to be a good game that players love to play, and I can't think of a better mantra that a game studio could possibly have. 
I am very much looking forward to what they have planned for the future, particularly when it comes to quality of life and player focused changes to the game, but after this first major update, I am very excited to see what they come up with. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. You're welcome.